good morning students uh, i will begin the class now and let us look at the text so this is the text and uh, you will remember those of you who had attended my last class that we were doing chapter 12 the professor and we were doing this part where uh, tigor was talking about uh, how uh, boys should not be judged uh, by the standards of grown ups and uh, every teacher should be able to uh, kind of understand that each child is uh kind of uh, he or she would be uh, more or less uh, kind of different and therefore uh, he or she should not be confined like a, like uh, in a particular way and uh, he or she should be allowed to grow naturally now let us continue uh, and see what tegor is saying there was a separate refreshment room for bengali boys for meeting their caste requirements this was where we struck up a friendship with some of the others they were all older than we one of these will bear to be dilated upon so tegor remembers one particular boy and he's uh, he is going to tell us about this boy his specialty was the art of magic so much so that he had actually written and published a little booklet on it the front page of which bore his name with the title of professor i had never before come across a school boy whose name had appeared in print so that my reverence for him as a professor of magic i mean was profound obviously uh, tigger was very much impressed with this boy who was a little older than tigger but he had already written and published a book on magic and with the title of professor how could i have brought myself to believe that anything questionable could possibly find place in the straight and upright ranks of printed letters to be able to record one's own words in indelible ink was that a slight thing to stand unscreened yet unabashed self confessed before the world how could one withhold belief in the face of such supreme self confidence I remember how once I got the types for the letters of my name from some printing press and what a memorable thing it seemed when I inked and pressed them on paper and found my name imprinted so he is recounting that particular uh, incident and he was really impressed how this boy had uh, printed this book with his name and it was not a mean achievement as he says was that a slight thing so he is asking and uh, there he was he was uh, proclaiming his work before the world with a lot of confidence and once he tried to do that himself with uh, getting the types for the letters of his own name and when he pressed that on to uh, paper he found his own name imprinted we used to give a lift in our carriage to this school fellow an author friend of ours so this uh, boy used to come to school with them this led to visiting terms he was also great at theatricals with his help we erected a stage 
on our wrestling ground with painted paper stretched over a split bamboo framework. But a peremptory negative from upstairs prevented any play from being acted thereon. So they had hoped to act a play and they had also erected a stage uh, with his help or advice. But the elders of the house, they uh, did not approve of such a venture or such a, a kind of thing to be done. A comedy of errors was however played later on without any stage at all. The author of this has already been introduced to the reader in these pages. He was none other than my nephew, Shotto. Those who behold his present calm and sedate demeanor would be shocked to learn of the tricks of which he was the originator. So, uh, Tagore here refers to Shotto, who was his nephew. And at that point of time, he was a very mischievous boy and he used to play tricks. Uh, the event of which I am writing happened sometime afterwards when I was 12 or 13. Well, uh, our magician friend had told off so many strange properties of things that I was consumed with curiosity to see them for myself. But the materials of which he spoke were invariably so rare or distant that one could hardly hope to get hold of them without the help of Sindbad the sailor. So uh, Tigger was about 12 years old or 13 years old and uh, this magician friend of theirs, he uh, told them uh, different stories or he told them that different things had very strange properties and uh, they were naturally very curious. But unfortunately for them, they did not know how to get them uh, without the help of Sindbad the sailor. I, I think you, uh, you know this reference because there, is, uh, there are a number of stories uh, featuring Sindbad the sailor. Uh, Sindbad was this sailor who had visited uh, far off lands and he had uh, undergone uh, different adventures and films have also been made on this story, uh, on the stories featuring Simba. Once as it happened, the professor forgot himself so far as to mention accessible things. Who could ever believe that a seed dipped and dried 21 times in the juice of a species of cactus would sprout and flower and fruit all in the space of an hour? I was determined to test this, not daring withal to doubt the assurance of a professor whose name appeared in a printed book. So now one day this professor, what he did, he uh, told them that a seed, if it was dipped and dried 21 times in the juice of a species of cactus that would flower, uh, that would sprout and flower and uh, it would have fruit within one hour. And that was a remarkable thing. So Tagore decided to test this out. I got our gardener to furnish me with a plentiful supply of the milky juice and betook myself on a Sunday afternoon to our mystic nook in a corner of the roof terrace to experiment with the stone of a mango. So he got the ingredients, the juice from this cactus and uh, the stone or the seed of a mango. I was wrapped in my task of dipping and drying, but the grown-up reader will probably not wait to ask me the result. In the meantime, I little knew that Shotto in another corner had in the space of an hour caused to root and sprout a mystical plant of his own creation. This was to bear curious fruit later on. So uh, Tigor was very much engrossed in this uh, task 
of trying to do as the professor had said and Shotto was uh, doing the same thing in another corner. After the day of this experiment, the professor rather avoided me as I gradually came to perceive. He would not sit on the same side in the carriage and altogether seemed to fight shy of me. Uh, now, the reference to Shotto uh, having uh, tried his hand at something uh, of a kind of uh, rooting and sprouting something, actually it was something that Shotto had said to, to the professor. And from that day onwards, next day onwards, the professor avoided him. One day, all of a sudden, he proposed that each one in turn should jump off the bench in our schoolroom. He wanted to observe the differences in style, he said. Such scientific curiosity did not appear queer in a professor of magic. Everyone jumped, so did I. He shook his head with a subdued, hmm, no amount of persuasion could draw anything further out of him. So, uh, suddenly one day the professor asked them to jump off the bench. He said that he wanted to uh, observe the differences in style. Uh, which the boys had of jumping off. And uh, uh, Tagore also jumped from the bench onto the ground and the professor observed everyone and he did not comment. He just uh, made a kind of a sound, but he did not comment. Uh, everyone tried to uh, ask him what he thought, but uh, he did not say anything. Another day, he informed us that some good friends of his wanted to make our acquaintance and asked us to accompany him to their house. Our guardians had no objection, so off we went. The crowd in the room seemed full of curiosity. They expressed their eagerness to hear me sing. I sang a song or two. Mere child as I was, I could hardly have bellowed like a bull. Quite a sweet voice, they all agreed. So uh, this was a kind of a uh, singing test or uh, he was asked to sing and he sang one or two songs and everyone agreed that he had a mellifluous, a very sweet voice. When the refreshments were put before us, they sat round and watched us eat. I was bashful by nature and not used to strange company. Moreover, the habit I acquired during the attendance of our servant Ishor left me a poor eater for good. They all seemed impressed with the delicacy of my appetite. So actually, uh, the meal that was given to them and uh, they had to eat before the others, these strange people or the strangers. And uh, Tagore says that... Uh, he was a kind of a kind of bashful by nature. Uh, he felt embarrassed, and he was not used to strangers. And as we know uh, how they were treated by the servants, and they were not given much to eat. So Tagore uh, did not have this uh, kind of habit of eating too many uh, too much, and he ate quite less. So. The people who observed them, uh, they commented that, yes, they were impressed by his delicacy of his appetite, that he was not a very voracious eater. In the fifth act, I got some curiously warm letters from our professor, which revealed the whole situation. And here let the curtain fall. So the professor then gave him certain warm letters. And then... Tagore understood what was the situation. I subsequently learned from Shotto that while I had been practicing magic on the mango seed, he had successfully convinced the professor that I was dressed as a boy by our guardians merely for getting me a better schooling, but that really this was only a disguise. So this was Shotto's trick and he played a trick on the professor. And he told the professor that Tigor was actually a girl and he was actually dressed as a boy because uh, his parents, they wanted to uh, send her or rather uh, Tigor to school. And since during those days girls did not go to school, 
they uh, had to dress him uh, dress her up like a boy so tigor uh, was really a girl to those who are curious in regard to imaginary science i should explain that a girl is supposed to jump with her left foot forward and this is what i had done on the occasion of the professor's trial i little realized at the time what a tremendously false step mine had been so the you know uh, that test that the professor had taken he wanted to see that whether uh, tigor would uh, jump with his left foot forward and and he did that and the professor was convinced that he was a girl because girls were supposed to uh, jump off uh, from the bench with their left foot forward uh, i am not sure whether girls do this but uh, really uh, this is what they believed and again as you can see that uh, tegor did not eat much and that was uh, another sign that he was a girl because girls don't eat, eat so much like boys and uh, so this is a kind of a and the uh, songs he sang because he had a voice like a girl because he was young and uh, that was another test so all these three tests uh, convinced the professor that he was a girl and uh, later on uh, he received those letters from the professor so this is a quite a funny incident that we see and it, this was shotto's doing his nephew who was a very mischievous kind of a boy so this is the chapter the professor and we learn how tigor was mistakenly erroneously taken up to be a girl by this uh, older boy who called himself the professor so here chapter 12 ends and now we will move on to chapter 13 and here tigor will be talking about his father Devendranath Thakur. Shortly after my birth, my father took to constantly traveling about. So it is no exaggeration to say that in my early childhood, I hardly knew him. He would now and then come back home all of a sudden, and with him came foreign servants, with whom I felt extremely eager to make friends. Once there came in this way a young Punjabi servant named Lenu. The cordiality of the reception he got from us would have been worthy of Ranjit Singh himself. Not only was he a foreigner, but a Punjabi to boot. What wonder he stole our hearts away. So, uh, Tagore's father, Devendranath Tagore, used to go on pilgrimages. And after Rabindranath was born, you know that Rabindranath was the youngest child. Uh, Tagore, uh, that is the senior Tagore, Devendranath, he went on pilgrimages and he hardly came back, uh, actually he came, came back all of a sudden and some foreign servants, he came back with some foreign servants and once he had gone to the Punjab and there was a Punjabi servant with him who was called Lenu and uh, this Lenu was very cordially received by them and uh, he was kind of accorded a very warm welcome as if he was King Ranjit Singh himself like that and Tagore used to be uh, very enthusiastic in trying to make friends with all the uh, foreign or other uh, people from other provinces. We had the same reverence for the whole Punjabi nation as for Vima and Arjuna of the Mahabharat, they were warriors. And if they had sometimes fought and lost, that was clearly the enemy's fault. It was glorious to have Lenu of the Punjab in our very home. So the Punjabi race, they were looked upon as warriors and very brave people. And that is why they were uh, looked upon highly. My sister-in-law had a model warship under a glass case, which when wound up, rocked on blue painted silken waves to the tinkling of a musical box. I would beg hard for the loan of this to display its marvels to the admiring Lenu. So this was a toy uh, model warship uh, and uh, Tagore wanted to show this to this person called Lenu. 
caged caged in the house as we were anything savoring of foreign parts had a peculiar charm for me this was one of the reasons why i made so much of leno this was also the reason why gabriel the jew with his embroidered gabardine who came to sell athers and scented oils starred me so and the huge kabulis with their dusty baggy trousers and knapsacks and bundles wrought on my young mind a fearful fascination so he is uh, tegor is here referring to the fact that since he had been cooped up he was not allowed to go out and meet other people uh, people who came from other provinces uh, they appeared a certain with a certain kind of charm to them and gabriel jew was there he was one person whom uh, tegor really liked and he really loved uh, loved to talk to him and he is referring to uh, this uh, 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 this uh, the kabuli wallas that is the kabuli wallas uh, now gabardine means a long cloak actually so uh, this person called gabriel used to wear this now the kabuli wallas as you know they wore a uh, long flowing uh, kind of baggy trousers and they had their knapsacks and bundles their cholas as it were and uh, the young tigor was really interested in them he uh, had a kind of a fearful fascination and you will recall that how uh, later on he wrote a story a very famous story called kabuli wala and that was made into a very famous film with uh, the wonderful actor chobi bishas acting as uh, in the role of the kabuli wala so you must have seen that film so uh, and you have must have read that story also if you have not read please read it so uh, this was uh, kind of as you can see the people who came from other provinces and kabuli wallas uh, had a great fascination for the young tigar anyhow when my father came we would be content with wandering round about his entourage and in the company of his servants we did not reach his immediate presence so uh, actually uh, there were so many servants uh, tigor could not really uh, go and meet his father and that is really strange but that is what happened once while my father was away in the himalayas that old bogey of the british government the russian invasion came to be a subject of agitated conversation among the people some well meaning lady friend had enlarged on the impending danger to my mother with all the circumstance of a prolific imagination how could a body tell from which of the tibetan passes the russian host might suddenly flash forth like a baleful comet so there was this fear of a russian invasion and the rumors were quite rampant and one of the lady friends of his mother the god's mother uh, she told them about this uh, this uh, likely invasion and that they might these uh, russians the russian invaders might come uh, through the himalayan passes the tibetan passes my mother was seriously alarmed possibly the other members of the family did not share her misgivings so despairing of grown up sympathy she sought my boyish support won't you write to your father about the russians she asked so tigor's mother felt alarm and uh, but unfortunately the other members of the family they were not concerned about the about this and since they did not listen to her she turned to her son and she asked her son to write to uh, write to his father and warn him about these russians that letter carrying the tidings of my mother's anxieties was my first one to my father i did not know how to begin or end a letter or anything at all about it i went to mohanando 
the estate Munshi. The resulting style of address was doubtless correct enough, but the sentiments could not have escaped the musty flavor inseparable from literature emanating from an estate office. So that was the first letter he had written to his father. And with the help of this person called Mohanando, who was the estate Munshi. So uh, Mohanando uh, helped Tagore to write this letter. And that was uh, a letter that was steeped in the flavors of the estate office. It was not really a letter from a son to his father. I got a reply to my letter. My father asked me not to be afraid. If the Russians came, he would drive them away himself. This confident assurance did not seem to have the effect of relieving my mother's fears, but it served to free me from all timidity as regards my father. So this was the reply that his father gave uh, them that he would be driving away the Russians himself. And uh, though his mother uh, did not really feel that much confident, but uh, Tigor was, uh, Tigor did not feel any kind of fear. After that, I wanted to write to him every day and pestered Mohanando accordingly. So that fear, that uh, distance which they, uh, that had been there with his father, uh, that was somehow breached. Unable to withstand my importunity, he would make out drafts for me to copy. But I did not know that there was the postage to be paid for. I had an idea that letters placed in Mohanando's hands got to their destination without any need for further worry. It is hardly necessary to mention that Mohanando being considerably older than myself, these letters never reached the Himalayan hilltops. So, uh, what Tagore did, he used to pester Mohanando with uh, drafts, tell him to write out the drafts and which Mohanando uh, obliged. Uh, he did that, but he never posted those letters because, of course, uh, he did not want that his master, that is Devendranath Tagore, should be disturbed by uh, his son's uh, so many letters. Uh, when, after his long absences, my father came home, even for a few days, the whole house seemed filled with the weight of his presence. We would see our elders at certain hours, normally robed in their chogas, passing to his rooms with restrained gait and sobered mien, casting away any pawn they might have been chewing. So when uh, he came back, that is Devendranath Tagore, the elders would uh, go and visit him. Everyone seemed on the alert to make sure of nothing going wrong. My mother would superintend the cooking herself. The old mess bearer Kinu with his white livery and crested turban on guard at my father's door would warn us not to be boisterous in the veranda in front of his, front of his rooms during his midday siesta. We had to walk past quietly talking in whispers, and, I, and dared not even take a peep inside. So when during the uh, afternoon time, uh, Devendranath Tagore would be resting, he would having his, uh, he'd be having his afternoon nap. Then this person called Kinu, who was this uh, kind of a guard who was there in uh, all, a kind of a uniform, he had a uniform and he would ask them, he would warn them not to shout and uh, play in a noisy way. So they had to be very quiet. On one occasion, my father came home to invest the three of us with the sacred thread. So it was the sacred thread ceremony. With the help of Pondit Bagish. He had collected the old Vedic rites for the purpose. For days together, we were taught to chant in correct accents the selections from the Upanishads, arranged by my father under the name of Brahmo Dharma, seated in the prayer hall with Bacharam Babu. Finally, with shaven heads and gold rings in our ears, we three budding Brahmins went into a three days retreat 
in a portion of the third story. So the three boys, they were uh, given the sacred thread. And they were, uh, they had become officially Brahmins. It was great fun. The earrings gave us a good handle to pull each other's ears with. We found a little drum lying in one of the rooms. Taking this, we would stand out in the veranda and when we caught sight of any servant passing alone in the story below, we would wrap our tattoo on it. This would make the man look up only to beat a hasty retreat the next moment with averted eyes. In short, we cannot claim that these days of our retirement were passed in ascetic meditation. So actually, uh, the rule was that when uh, any uh, new Brahmin, actually when uh, boys were initiated into this, uh, you know, this Uponoyam ceremony as it is called, when they were given the sacred thread, they had to retire to a room and they should not, uh, they should not be seen by anyone and they should live there alone. Uh, so stay there alone and their food would be given to them and all that they could not come out and anyone uh, of the lower caste could not look at them. So actually Tigor and his two companions, they beat up on the drums because they wanted to play tricks on the on these servants. So would look up when they heard the sound of the drums and uh, then they would uh, they would have to go away because it was not proper for them to look at the new Brahmins. So this is the reference here. I am however persuaded that boys like ourselves could not have been rare in the hermitages of old. And if some ancient document has it, the 10 or 12 year old uh, Sharodatta uh, or Sharnogarvo is spending the whole of the days of his boyhood offering oblations and chanting mantras, uh, we are not compelled to put unquestioning faith in the statement because the book of boy nature is even older and also more authentic. So he uh, he's saying, Tagore is saying that even in the old stories, in the Shastras and in the other stories, mythologies, uh, in ancient India, when boys were initiated into this sacred thread ceremony, they were not mischievous. And he refers to these two uh, boys uh, of old. Uh, and uh, he is quite sure that those boys who, uh, during those ancient times, they also did not spend their time fully or uh, wholly in chanting mantras and paying homage to the to God. So the book of boy nature is even older and more and so more authentic. So uh, boys. Uh, the boy nature, as it were, the nature of boys has remained more or less the same. After we had attained full Brahminhood, I became very keen on repeating the Gayatri. So uh, the Gayatri mantra is the mantra that uh, the Brahmins uh, actually they recite after, uh, after the sacred thread ceremony. I would meditate on it with great concentration. It is hardly a text, the full meaning of which I could have grasped at that age. I will remember what efforts I made to extend the range of my consciousness with the help of the initial invocation of earth, firmament and heaven. So uh, the beginning of the Gayatri Mantra and, and that uh, how uh, that initial invocation was made to earth, the sky and the sky and the whole of heaven. How I felt or thought it is difficult to express clearly, but this much is certain that to be clear about the meaning of words is not the most important function of the human understanding. So uh, uh, he would not be able to explain clearly what he felt during those early days about these 
Gayatri Montro, uh, but uh, he could not, of course, understand wholly the meanings of these words. And he says that it is not the most important function, knowing the meanings of words. The main object of teaching is not to explain meanings, but to knock at the door of the mind. So here Tagore is again explicating. He is talking about uh, education in general, how education should be imparted. If any boy is asked to give an account of what is awakened in him at such knocking, he will probably say something very silly. So to knock at the door of the mind, to enlighten the mind. For what happens within is much bigger than what he can express in words. So the inner mind, that has to be opened up. Those who pin their faith on university examinations as a test of all educational results take no account of this fact. So just taking uh, into account the uh, getting good marks in the university examinations, that would not suffice. And actually, this is this should not be done. I can recollect many things which I did not understand, but which stirred me deeply. Once, on the roof terrace of our riverside villa, my eldest brother, at the sudden gathering of clouds, repeated aloud some stanzas from Kalidas's Cloud Messenger. That is, uh, as you know, Kalidas uh, has a poem called this uh, called Meghdut. I could not, nor had I the need to, understand a word of the Sanskrit. His ecstatic declamation of the sonorous rhythm was enough for me. So, Tigot's eldest brother, he was uh, repeating or he was reciting some stanzas from this Meghdut. Uh, and that was in Sanskrit, of course. Uh, Rabindranath did not, uh, was not able to understand the meaning of what he was saying, the exact meaning of the words, but he could uh, feel the, the emotion that was there in the lines, the way his uh, brother recited those lines, and the kind of rhythm and music that those lines had. Then again, before I could properly understand English, a profusely illustrated edition of the old curiosity shop fell into my hands. Uh, the old curiosity shop is a novel by Charles Dickens. It is one of his earlier novels. You have read Oliver Twist. And The Old Curiosity Shop is uh, another novel which he wrote after that. Uh, and Tigor, when uh, actually he was uh, not able to understand uh, English properly, but he came across this book. I went through the whole of it, though at least nine-tenths of the words were unknown to me. So this is remarkable how that the boy Tigor read the whole book, though he could not understand much of the work. Uh, yet, with the vague ideas, I conjured up from the rest. I spun out a variously colored thread on which to string the illustrations. Any university examiner would have given me a great big zero, but the reading of the book had not proved for me quite so empty as all that. So he is saying that uh, with his limited understanding, the vague ideas that he had, and uh, his imagination, it could spin a kind of a web. And uh, the illustrations that he came across, uh, he made up a kind of a his own story, as it were, which would fetch zero in the university exam if he were to sit for, a, for an exam. But there was something that he had gained from his reading of the 
old curiosity shop. It was not entirely empty, as he says. Another time, I had accompanied my father on a trip on the Ganges in his houseboat. Among the books he had with him was an old Fort William edition of Joydev's Git Govindo. It was in the Bengali character. The verses were not printed in separate lines, but ran on like prose. I did not then know anything of Sanskrit, yet because of my knowledge of Bengali, many of the words were familiar. I cannot tell how often I read that Git Govindo. So uh, again, uh, Tagore read uh, the Git Govindo, Joydev's Git Govindo. This is another famous text. And it was in Bengali character, but the language was Sanskrit. So Tagore could read that. And uh, some of the words were quite familiar to him. And he remembers this line. I can well remember this line. What was this line? The night that was passed in the lonely forest cottage. This is the line. Uh, it spread an atmosphere of vague beauty over my mind. That one Sanskrit word, Nibhrito Nikunjo Griham, meaning the lonely forest cottage, was quite enough for me. So, uh, this was a kind of an, uh, you know, this uh, particular line had a great uh, effect on him. And uh, the Sanskrit word, Nibhrito Nikunjo Griham. Nibhrito, of course, means secluded. Nikunjo Griham, uh, the lonely forest cottage, translated into English. So, uh, as you can see, uh, it spread an atmosphere of vague beauty over my mind. Uh, he was really struck by this uh, uh, this word and um, I had to discover for myself the intricate meter of joy days and uh, the intricate meter of joy Dev because its divisions were lost in the clumsy prose form of the book so it was like a kind of a prose work. And this discovery gave me very great delight. Of course, I did not fully comprehend Joydev's meaning. It would hardly be correct to aver that I had got it even partly. But the sound of the words and the lilt of the meter filled my mind with pictures of wonderful beauty which impelled me to copy out the whole of the book for my own use. So this book had such a tremendous impact on him that uh, he copied out the whole book. And this uh, was really a wonderful uh, kind of an experience for him, reading this book. The same thing happened when I was a little older with a verse from Kalidas's birth of the war god. The verse moved me greatly, though the only words of which I gathered the sense were the breeze carrying the spray mist of the falling waters of the sacred Mandakini and shaking the deodar leaves. So uh, Tigor could only understand this particular line, the verse that is. These left me pining to taste the beauties of the whole. When later a Pandit explained to me that in the next two lines the bees went on, splitting the feathers of the peacock plume on the head of the eager deer hunter, the thinness of this last conceit disappointed me. I was much better off when I had relied only upon my imagination to complete the verse. So, uh, this line also had a really big impression, made a big impression on him. And he wanted to read the whole uh, 
full poem and later on a pandit explained to him that uh, the next two lines the breeze was doing this and that which Tigore did not uh, find to be uh, as interesting as the previous line because uh, he had already kind of uh, made up with his own imagination uh, the other lines. Whoever goes back to his early childhood will agree that his greatest gains were not in proportion to the completeness of his understanding. Our Kathakas, uh, I know this truth well, so their narratives always have a good proportion of ear feeling Sanskrit words and abstruse remarks, not calculated to be fully understood by their simple hearers, but only to be suggestive. So, uh, the completeness of the understanding. That was not there, but still, that was not the only thing. The value of such suggestion is by no means to be despised by those who measure education in terms of material gains and losses. These insist on trying to sum up the account and find out exactly how much of the lesson imparted can be rendered up. But children, and those who are not over-educated dwell in that primal paradise where men can come to know without fully comprehending each step. And only when that paradise is lost comes the evil day when everything needs must be understood. So uh, here Tagore is saying that the value of that suggestion, the fact that uh, the importance of imagination, the suggestion that is there and uh, that is important. Actually, he says that children and people who are not so well educated, who cannot understand everything that they have read, they actually they benefit in the sense that they are in that primal paradise. They come to know things without fully understanding them. That is, they can fill up the gaps with their own imagination. And only when that paradise is lost. So he is calling this a blessed state. And the evil day comes when everything has to be understood. Uh, the road which leads to knowledge without going through the dreary process of understanding, that is the royal road. So, Tagore is of the opinion that one uh, should not, or it is not imperative, it is not really necessary to try and understand everything. So, the royal road should be that uh, which which is taken uh, when one cannot fully understand a particular text or something, but uh, he or she can fill up the gaps, bridge the gaps with his, his or her, her own understanding or imagination. If that be bad, though the world's marketing may yet go on as usual, the open sea and the mountain top cease to be possible of access. So here Tagore is saying that if that particular avenue is blocked, uh, the world will continue in its old way. World's marketing may yet go on as usual. The open sea and the mountain top cease to be possible of access. So the imagination will not be working. So, as I was saying, though at that age I could not realize the full meaning of the Gayatri, there was something in me which could do without a complete understanding. I am reminded of a day when, as I was seated on the cement floor in a corner of our schoolroom 
meditating on the text, my eyes overflowed with tears. Why those tears came, I knew not. And to a strict cross-questioner, I would probably have given some explanation having nothing to do with the Gayatri. The fact of the matter is that what is going on in the inner recesses of consciousness is not always known to the dweller on the surface. So Tagore ends this chapter with this uh, particular incident. He is saying that one day he was seated on the corner of, a, of the schoolroom. He was looking at the text, but he, uh, for some reason or the other, he uh, felt very emotional and his eyes uh, became uh, over, <clears throat> they were overflowing with tears. Uh, he did not know the reason why he suddenly felt like that. Uh, and uh, most probably, if anyone asked him why he was crying, uh, he, would know, he would have given an explanation which had nothing to do with the Gayatri. So uh, he is saying, in the inner consciousness, in the inner mind of a person, uh, whatever goes on in the inner mind, that cannot be always seen. Ob obviously, that is that remains hidden. And the dweller on the surface, the person himself, sometimes fails to understand what is happening to him or her. So this is the uh, the chapter, you know, uh, on titled My Father. And at the beginning, as we see here, the chapter 13, uh, he talks about his father and how later on, how they, the three boys, they were given, uh, they were initiated into Brahminhood. So um, we will stop here today and uh, two more chapters remain and we will uh, try and complete those in the next class.